This is the second video for occupancy groups. So if you haven't seen the first video, then click here for that part one. In this video, we'll continue to master the essential occupancy groups for the rest of the most common building types. In part one, we reviewed A, B, E, and F occupancies. Let's continue with the next category. And what do you know it? The next group that we're considering is the high hazard group H occupancy. This is the use of a building or structure or a portion thereof that involves the manufacturing, processing, generation or storage of materials that constitute a physical or health hazard in quantities in excess of those allowed. This occupancy can have probably an entire video dedicated to the topic, but we won't go further than defining the groups. There are five subgroups within the H group, H1 through H5. The quantity of the hazardous materials, the nature of its use, and how hazardous the material is will determine the occupancy. Let's quickly review each one. H1 is the high hazard group, and this is buildings or structures that contain materials that pose a detonation hazard shall be classified as group H1. Such materials include, but are not limited to, detonable pyrophoric materials. These are materials that can ignite spontaneously with the presence of air or water. Okay, H2 is a high hazard group as well, and it's buildings and structures that contain materials that pose a, a deflagration hazard or a hazard from accelerated burning. These shall be classified as H2. What does that include, might you ask? Well, class one, two, two A, flammable or combustible liquids. And of course, a whole list of other materials. If you're wondering what this is in real life, some examples would include isopropyl alcohol, ethanol, diesel fuel, and more. These liquids are classified by their flashpoint or their combustibility, and therefore would be an H2. H3 is a high hazard group of buildings and structures that contain materials that readily support combustion or that pose a physical hazard shall be classified as group H3. And you can read the list of materials that are included in the code section of the IBC section 307. H4 is a high hazard group these are buildings and structures that contain materials that are health hazards. Such materials include and are not limited to, and I love how the code says corrosives, but then it says highly toxic materials and then toxic materials. I would think that a material characterizes toxic is toxic regardless, whether it's highly or lowly. <laughs> Anyways, well, I didn't become a material scientist for many reasons. But just know that toxic materials would fall in the H4 category. Moving on to H5, which is the high hazard group. Well, semiconductor fabrication facilities and comparable research and development areas in which hazardous production materials are used. And these quantities are in excess of those that are specified in Table 307.1 of the IBC are classified as Group H5. I think that table is quite interesting because it actually does tell you the quantities of materials that would exceed those thresholds. Moving on to the next group, which is institutional group I occupancy, which is the use of a building or structure or portion thereof in which care or supervision is provided to persons who are or not capable of self-preservation without physical assistance or in which persons are detained for penal or correctional purposes or in which the liberty of the occupants is restricted. There are four subgroups, I1 through I4. These groups are subdivided by the abilities of occupants to take care of themselves in an emergency and the number of occupants, their ages, health, and how much time they spend in the facility. If they fall out of the threshold of the I occupancy, then they would fall under the R residential occupancy, which we'll get to. I1 institutional group. There's more than 16 people who are living under supervision in a residential environment on a 24 hour basis. These occupants are capable of responding to an emergency with little or no assistance from staff. This includes halfway houses, assisted living facilities, and group homes. Okay, just remember, these are on a 24 hour basis, but folks in these facilities are capable of responding to an emergency on their own. And if there are less than 16 occupants, 
then it may fall under R4 occupancy. And if there are fewer than five occupants, it may fall under R3 occupancy. Next, institutional group I2. Has greater than five occupants living under supervised custodial care on a 24-hour basis. These occupants cannot respond to emergencies without staff assistance. So this group includes hospitals, detox facilities, and nursing homes. 24-hour childcare for more than five children at two and a half years of age or less may fall under the I2 classification. Next group, institutional group I3, has more than five people living under supervised conditions under restraint or security on a 24-hour basis. They cannot respond to emergencies without staff assistance due to the security measures. So these folks are not necessarily because of uh, physical reasons that they cannot respond to emergencies, but they're actually detained. So this group includes prisons, detention centers, and more. This group is actually further subdivided into nine conditions in the CBC based on relative freedom of movement inside a facility, which we won't get into, but just know that. And if you're curious enough, definitely go check it out for I3. Institutional group I4 occupancy is occupied by more than six clients of any age who receive custodial care for fewer than 24 hours per day by persons other than parents or guardians and in a place other than the home of the clients cared for. This group includes, but is not limited to, adult daycare and childcare. That is not classified as group E. Moving on to the next category, mercantile group M occupancy, which includes the use of a building or structure or a portion thereof for the display and sale of merchandise and involves stocks of goods, wares, or merchandise and where the public has access. These occupancies include, but are not limited to, department stores, drug stores, markets, and more. Incidental storage areas that are 10% or less in these groups are considered as an accessory area, part of the same occupancy group, based on section 508.3.1. Larger storage areas are classified as group S, but most retail facilities, I mean, regardless of the merchandise being sold, will fall into this category. M category. Next category, R for residential, is the use of a building or structure or portion thereof, and you guessed it, for sleeping purposes. This occupancy is divided into R1 through R4, which is based on the total number of occupants, and so that becomes the distinguishing factor. A key criteria for this, occup for this occupancy group is that occupants are sleeping in the building. That's how you know it's residential. R1 occupancy types contain sleeping units where occupants are primarily transient in nature. Yes, if you guessed hotels and motels, then that would be a group R1. And this R1 occupancy, because people are transient, assumes that the occupants are not familiar with their surroundings and therefore would be designed a certain way to take that into consideration for life safety. Next is residential group R2 occupancies, which contain sleeping units or more than two dwelling units where the occupants are primarily permanent in nature. So these would include apartment houses, dormitories, and even vacation timeshare properties. And there's a whole long list. You can check it out. The next group is residential group R3, which is an occupancy where the occupants are primarily permanent in nature. What do we mean by that? Well, these would be single family residences and duplexes and daycare facilities for five or fewer people using the facility for less than 24 hours will also fall into this occupancy group. So if you have a neighbor who's running a daycare center uh, and they have fewer than five kids who are actually utilizing that home, then that would be classified as R3. Moving on to R4. Residential group R4 includes more than six ambulatory clients or walking or moving clients, but not more than 16 persons, excluding staff, who reside on a 24-hour basis in a supervised residential environment and receive custodial care. This occupancy group may be used instead of group I, which was similar to meet specific code requirements. All right, well, hang in there. We're almost through two more large categories to go through. 
The next category is storage, group S, occupancy. These would be storage spaces that are not classified under the hazardous occupancy. And there are two subgroups, which are similar to the subgroups in F occupancy. So we'll have moderate hazard for S1 and low hazard for S2. Storage group S1 occupancies are occupied for storage uses including, but not limited to aerosol products, beverages, and a whole list of items. Storage group S2 occupancies include storage of non-combustible materials, such as products on wood pallets or in paper cartons with or without single thickness divisions, etc. This includes and is not limited to asbestos, cement and bags, electrical motors, food products, and more. Remember, just like the distinction between F1 and F2, the distinction between S1 and S2 is whether the products are combustible or not. And finally, the final category in this video for the most common occupancy types is U for utility and miscellaneous which are buildings and structures of an accessory character and miscellaneous structures that are not classified in any specific occupancy. What might that be if you're asking yourself? Well, this would include agricultural buildings, carports, private garages, stables, and more. The list goes on. So those are the 10 most common occupancy types. And so now that you've listened to it, and hopefully when you have a chance, if you're listening to this in the car, driving, or wherever you are, and can sit and actually look at it on the screen, then bringing in your audible, but also your visual senses will help you remember these more. But we're not done with the video yet. The best part is yet to come. We're about to jump into four practice questions that if you can solve these four practice questions, then I think you can ace any problem given to you that has to do with occupancy types. Are you ready for it? If you are, then click here in the video for the next part and let's practice them together. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and see you in the next video.